I want to thank you for joining me on Tuesday Bible Study. Oh, we've got a brand new book we're going to be looking at. Let's start with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessings on this day. We look forward to digging into something new. And just ask you to guide us and direct us in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, I bet you, you never thought we'd get out of Paul. You know, we've been doing a lot with Paul. We did some in Romans. We get, did some in Ephesians. There's more Paul coming this year. I promise you. However... It'll be nice to do something, change a pace. But James, let, let's take a look at the book of James, first of all. James is, honestly, let me, let me put this down. James is the anti-Paul. I mean that very seriously. This book, James, was put in the Bible to disagree and be disagreeable to Paul's theology. There were a lot of Christians who felt like, we got too much Paul in here. We don't like what Paul has to say. We think this view needs to be represented. We think Paul is way overstating his case. And they're looking for a book to put in there, and they ran to the book of James. James is not well attested to uh, as a very ancient book. We know it was written, obviously, in the first century, maybe around 65 uh, AD. So we're not saying that it wasn't written early, but it wasn't much copied. It wasn't a beloved book like Paul's books, so it wasn't spread around all over the place, over the entire Christendom. It was kind of one of these books that we stumbled into very, very, very late, and it is one of the later additions to, to the canon of the Bible with great opposition. There were a couple of books that many Christians thought should not be in the Bible. Book of James, and also the Book of Revelation. In fact, Saint... Uh, uh, Saint uh, Martin Luther, he wouldn't appreciate me calling him a saint, but he was. Nevertheless, Martin Luther calls this the gospel of straw. What the heck? What does that mean? Well, let's put it this way. If you know anything about animals, animals do not eat straw. They eat hay. Straw has zero nutritional value to animals. So in essence, what uh, Luther was saying is the, the book of James has absolutely zero nutritional value to, uh, for it for the Christian. It's got no good news in it. Um, obviously, some people disagree. So let's take a look at how it got in there, who wrote this book, and then we're going to take a look at that first chapter just briefly. So who wrote the book? Well, uh, duh, hmm, let me see. guy named James, right? James who? There are three, no less than three different Jameses that we run into in the Bible. So which James was it? Or was it another James? This James never is identified. Uh, one James, one possibility that some people think is true, um, James, or pardon me, James, the brother of John. No, not John the Baptist. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder. That's what Zebedee means. The sons of thunder, okay? So these guys are rocking guys, all right? So all, some people think that that's who this might be, and uh, the, this is the guy who wrote it. That really is not the agreed-upon position. Some scholars believe that. Most scholars believe that it was James, the brother Oh, I'm going to get controversial here. Of Jesus. Jesus had brothers? Yes. Jesus not only had brothers, Jesus had sisters. Now, in the Roman Catholic Church, because they don't like this idea of Mary being anything but perpetually a virgin, uh, as though she'd never had sex with her husband, Joseph, which is absolutely asinine, stupid idea. Come on. Um... The Bible actually says that Jesus did have brothers and sisters, and they came and thought that Jesus was a little bit crazy. They wanted to take him away. One, uh, one of them was this guy named James. Okay, We believe that this is the guy that wrote this book. In fact, this James is attested to, um, and uh, this, this guy is attested to, um, oh my gosh, my mind just went blank. I'm going to see if it's in my notes. It's not in my notes. He is attested to, uh, uh, in one of the early Roman historians, we see this guy, and I apologize, my mind is blank on his name, but one of the early uh, Roman historians acknowledges this James and tells us that he was killed in about 65 
A.D. I, and I think the tradition is, is that it, or the, the story is, is that he was actually by uh, push off the temple wall and fell to his death by people who didn't like the fact that he was the brother of Jesus and didn't like the fact that he was following Jesus' footstep and preaching about what Jesus had come to do. That's a uh, tradition kind of established by a Roman historian, but remember this Roman historian lived about 200 years after these events, so we don't know if there's any truth to that whatsoever. Now, the reason why then the book of James was placed into the Bible was, or given some credibility, is because of its association with the brother of Jesus. That's who Origen thought that wrote this book. Who is Origen? Origen was one of the early church fathers, lived around in 200 AD. He believed that this book was passed on, and it was an important book to, you know, <clears throat> put Paul in his place. Because Origen didn't care for Paul a whole heck of a lot. And so James then became accepted as one of the books in the Bible. As I mentioned to you, I am serious about this as the anti-Pauline uh, epistle. It was meant to confront, and you can see that James actually knows of Paul. You can see that, and he attacks a lot of the ideas of Paul. Doesn't come out outright and say, Paul, you're stupid and you're crazy, but he does disagree with Paul and Paul's position, or at least the extremes to which Paul can be taken. So what is he talking about? Let's take a look at this. Today's lesson. Today's lesson, as I said, is kind of a little bit refreshing compared to what we're looking at in Paul's, or Paul's book, because basically it's just a, a book of advice. It's a book of aphorisms. We don't really learn a whole lot about Jesus. We're not told about everything that he's done for us. We're not necessarily told about the cross, and this is again why Martin Luther thought it was a gospel of straw, because there's really nothing about the good news of what Christ has done for us and how Christ wants to transform our life. It's all about law, 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 do this, do this, do this. This is advice about what you should do, and Paul, and Paul wouldn't have liked that, and Martin Luther certainly didn't like that either, and that's why they both kind of demurred to this, and a lot of the early church fathers did. So, the first thing he says, let's start reading this, verse 17. Every good thing, James writes, and every perfect gift is from above, coming from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variation or shifting of shadow. Well, again, that's a nice little aphorism, and it's true. Nothing about Jesus, though. Okay, this again is what, what Martin Luther's problem is with it. It doesn't clearly communicate. You can read the, the book of James, but you will not come out with an understanding of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for you. That's why Martin Luther disagreed with it, and that's why some of the early Christian fathers really didn't want this book in the Bible, because it wasn't a clear witness as to what Jesus Christ has come to do. Nevertheless, it's in the Bible, and it's a good book, as long as we surround it with the context of other books that tell us about who Jesus is. As long as you don't read this, <laughs> and it's be your only book of faith. All right, so every good thing comes from he Father in Heaven. In the exercise of His will, He gave us birth by the word of truth so that we would be a kind of first fruit among His creation. Another great aphorism, you're God's first fruit because of the truth that He's birthed into your hearts. And so you now represent God. You're an ambassador, you represent God. So let's, let's put this down. You represent God. God. Oh, but there's going to be consequences for representing God. You're the first fruit of God's truth. So what does that mean? Well, you're supposed to do something in James's opinion. Do you already see the problem that this might create when you compare it to Paul? Paul says you're a first fruit because of what God has done. It is by grace that you're saved through faith, not of works. This is not James' perspective. He's pushing back against at least the abuses of what Paul was being used for. Okay? So, verse 19. You know this, my beloved brothers and sisters. Now, everyone must be quick to hear. Oh, I love this. This is actually really good. It's good advice, especially for today, where we Christians are all hating on one another who disagree with our political opinions, which honestly are meaningless because not one of them are going to last it another year or two. They're, it's going to be all passe in a year or two. Everything that's getting you so angry is going to be gone in a year. All right? This is going to be gone. Who cares? 
United States of America, not going to last forever. I love my country, I do. It's great, I'm glad I live here, but the United States of America ain't in God's plan of salvation. It's just not listed in the Bible, okay? It's not an important thing in terms of salvation, so let it go. I'm not saying not be passionate about it, I get it, but let it go. So what we're supposed to do is quick to hear, he says, quick to hear. Today, what happens is, is people are, you know, they're listening to somebody with whom they disagree with, and they're trying to break in and tell you what my opinion is. No, he says, listen, just listen. Shut your dang trap and listen. Okay? In fact, that's the name of, of today's lesson. Christian, stop yapping your gums. Be quick to hear. Spend more time listening than you do speaking. And make sure you understand what the person is saying. Again, we're filled in a world of, of, of lots of opinions. You know, it's interesting. We just uh, came through the season of the Olympics in Japan. One of the cultural things unique to Japan is that people don't like to give their opinions very strongly because they don't want to seem like they're overly aggressive or overly angry or overly arrogant because that's bad form. Gosh, we really need to do that. Be quick to listen to one another, he says. What does he go? He goes on, drops a few more aphorisms. So he goes on, you know this, beloved sisters, now everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak. Stop and listen to what the other person is saying, the heartfelt pleas that are upon their hearts. We're so quick to want to rebut them and tell them what we think. Just stop and listen to them. Care about what they say. And then he goes on, and slow to anger. Now anger, by the way, anger is not a sin. It's how we use anger that can be a sin. Anger is actually a gift of God that tells you that there's something wrong and somebody's crossed barriers that they should not be crossing, social barriers or other things in your life, and it's getting you angry. Well, there's an indication that something needs to be done. Well, it may be you're the person that needs to change. Sometimes we get angry because it's telling us that there's something at fault in us that needs to be changed. We're getting angry about something that's really stupid, like, oh, I don't know, as I already mentioned, the aforementioned politics. It gets us so angry. Or maybe it is something that needs to be angry, get us angry. Okay, but then what do we do to fix it? So anger is a gift of God as long as it's used appropriately and constructively. But listen to what James says. However, a man's anger doesn't bring about the righteousness of God. So if you stay in anger and you act out of anger, that's not going to bring in God's righteousness. Again, it's all about creating right relationship with others. Therefore, rid yourselves of all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness and humility. Here's another one. Humility. We've got to have a little bit more of that in our lives. Humility is this. I could be wrong. Maybe we need to be more like the Japanese. Okay? Less opinionated. Listen a lot more. When we state our opinion, say, I may be wrong. Have a little humility. We don't have that in this country. We all think we're right. And so we just yell at each other and talk over each other. This is, these are good, this is a good lesson for that. All right. Rid yourselves of filthiness, all the remains of wickedness, and humility. Receive the word and planted, which is able to save your souls. So in humility, when you receive in humility, you understand that you are wrong. And so you accept what God wants to say, or you accept what other people are telling you, because you could be wrong. That's what James is telling us. Prove yourselves, and here's where he takes on Paul. Okay? We see this also this week and next week, too. And he just, Paul and here are loggerheads. And you could definitely tell that he's read Paul. He says, geez, whether he agrees with Paul or not, or maybe he just thinks that Paul is being horribly abused. He's confronting the theology of Paul here. He says, prove yourselves doers of the word, not just hearers who deceive themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, 
He's like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror, for once he's looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what type of person he was. But the one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of freedom, and has continued it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an active doer, this person will be blessed in what he does. Oh, well, Paul would never say that, right? You won't hear that out of Paul. Because again, what does Paul say? It is, Paul's continual mantra is, it is by grace we are saved, not works. Well, that kind of is getting James going a little bit. He's like, Paul, you're dummy. Come on, man. You, if you're a Christian, you got to be doing some work. All right? You got to be doing something. So he's pushing against Paul, or at least the abuse of Paul's thoughts that people were uh, doing. So he says, you got to become an active doer. It goes on verse 26. If anyone thinks of himself to be a religious person, yet doesn't bridle his tongue. I love that image. You got to put a bridle on it, man. You know, when you got a bridle in there, it's tough to talk, right? So maybe talk a little bit less. So if anyone thinks of himself as a religious person but doesn't bridle his tongue, he deceives his own heart. The person's religion is worthless. I like that. The person's religious is worthless. Uh, you know, again, just stop speaking, peoples. Stop your speaking. Stop your bloviating. All right? If you don't know that word, look it up. All right? Christians, stop yapping your gums and just be caring. In fact, that's how he ends it. He says, Pure and undefiled religion is this, in the sight of our God and Father, to visit orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. So again, what's he trying to tell us? Shut your yap, your yammer. Stop speaking so much. <laughs> Listen a little, lot more. And then show your love of God by being generous to those who are marginalized and who are hurting. Dang, man. Uh, I think it's a good lesson. I might take Luther on a little bit with this. I mean, I get what Luther is trying to say. It truly is a gospel straw. There's no good news of what Jesus has done for us in here. But... Those of us who've been touched and transformed by the love of God do need to respond in some way or will respond in some way because we've been loved by God by listening more, shutting our, the, our traps, shutting our mouth, and caring more for those who are in need. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again. We thank you for the mouths we got, but I ask you to help us to shut it a lot more and listen more and care more for those around us. I think this is James' concern, that we put our faith into action by loving those around us and by just keeping our yammer shut. People just need to be loved today. And so we ask you to help us to be more caring and loving. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you and send you forth in peace in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.